Welcome to Conlang Critic, the show that gets facts wrong about your favorite Conlang. I'm Jan Miesely, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the verbless artlang, Kalen. When I first heard the concept of Kalen, I was immediately skeptical. No verbs? That can't be right. How would that even work? Surely what Kalen does is relabel its verbs in a way that disguises their function, or maybe there's just a large set of things that you can't say in Kalen, right? Kalen is a fictional language created by Sylvia Sotomayor, who has been working on it since 1980. At the time of writing, the most recent update to it was made in June 2019. In universe, it's a non-human language spoken by elves called the Kalen. There is definitely some external lore associated with Kalen, but the language largely exists as a standalone work. Kalen's consonants are m, n, m, n, p, t, s, k, k, h, s, s, h, h, l, y, r. Okay, I really like this inventory. It's not especially unique or anything, but it's well-balanced in a way where everything definitely fits together nicely. Big fan of the palatal series and that labial fricative. Now, you might be wondering about the placement of su there in the stop row, which is definitely not a stop consonant. Sylvia explains that in-universe it was historically an affricate, su, that ended up shifting into a fricative for most speakers. It makes sense to still consider it a stop due to the way it behaves phonotactically. Stops and fricatives are phonemically voiceless, but they are sometimes voiced, specifically when one comes between two phonemically voiced sounds. The difference between how they behave is that some speakers pronounce fricatives as voiced in all contexts, which doesn't apply to su. That is, I think, enough to justify the apparent mislabeling. That and the fact that it makes the chart narrower. Most of the resonants here also have geminated forms listed. Specifically, all the nasals and all the liquids except the palatal lateral. I don't think it's strictly necessary to analyze these as separate phonemes for reasons I will explain in a bit. Kalen's vowels are e, u, e, u, e, o, e, o, a, a. It's just the five vowel system plus length, pretty basic. There also exists a marginally phonemic closed central vowel, only appearing in some dialects, which lets me rearrange this whole dang chart. There's also a few diphthongs, which are ye, ye, i, ow, i, ow. Sylvia doesn't explicitly define Kalen's syllable structure on her website any further than consonant vowel consonant. However, I was able to get a feel for what stuff is allowed just by looking at the canon word list. Which leads to the main reason I don't think it makes sense to call the double resonance separate phonemes. There are plenty of examples in the word list of doubled versions of other consonants. So I think the more sensible analysis is to say that the doubled consonants are just a consonant appearing in the coda of one syllable, then appearing again in the onset of the next syllable. Especially since there are no examples of any double consonant appearing anywhere other than between two vowels. Though I guess to get a full understanding of the phonotactics, I'd have to check every single possible pair of consonants to see if they're attested in the word list. And that sounds like a lot of work. I don't really want to do that. I mean, I'd have to check, like, what, eight NIF pairs of phonemes? Yeah, I'm not doing that. So here's a table showing which pairs of consonants exist in words in the canon dictionary. I guess I should say that just because there aren't any attested words that have a specific cluster doesn't necessarily mean that that cluster isn't allowed. It's instead more useful to look at the big picture. Even though only seven consonants appear word finally, all but one appear syllable finally, the exception being the palatal lateral. Granted, that's only if you consider the geminate consonants to be one consonant twice in a row rather than phonemes in their own right. Let's remove all the rows for consonants where the only time they appear in the coda is when they're geminated. Looking at it like this, you can see that some types of consonant clusters completely don't exist. There are no sequences of a stop followed by a fricative or two different fricatives in a row. The only stop-stop sequences that exist are ones where the first stop is s, which is definitely making me kinda regret going along with the analysis that s is a stop. Oh well. I think Kalen's phonology is pretty good, even though it obviously wasn't the main focus. It definitely serves the language well and has a nice aesthetic. Before I get into Kalen's orthographies, I'm going to start with the romanization. Really, the only thing I don't like here is the use of W for H. It does work for the common voiced allophone V, but even then V would be better for it than W. Everything else makes sense. I do, however, have a super nitpicky complaint about the way it's presented. On her website, Sylvia for some reason uses slashes to mark the romanization, and she does the same thing when giving examples from other languages. This caused seconds of confusion where I assumed based on convention that this was supposed to be phonemic transcription. I assume this is a holdover from some web 1.0 restriction, but like, come on. Slashes are for phonemic transcription, and orthography should use angle brackets. 
Anyway, Kalen has two orthographies. The main one is an alphabet that looks like this. The line across the top of everything makes it look a whole lot like Devanagari, but functionally it's just an alphabet. Its design is somewhat featural. For example, fricatives are written with letters that look like their corresponding stops, but with an extra line added to the right. And there's a few place of articulation diacritics used consistently for nasals and liquids. You might have noticed on this chart that there's apparently a letter for some sort of palatal trill. That is, of course, the letter for R, with the same palatal diacritic used for writing the two palatal residents. Since there isn't an actual palatal trill phoneme, it's used for the cluster Archa. The place of articulation diacritics are also used for writing diphthongs, which is pretty neat. This alphabet is solid, but it's easily the less interesting of Kalin's two writing systems. Kalin's other orthography is its ceremonial interlace alphabet, which, as the name implies, is an alphabet used for ceremonial purposes with an interlace aesthetic. Before going over how it works, I'd just like to say how beautiful this is. I really like interlace as a decorative style, and using it for a writing system is such a cool idea. Everything ends up looking like ribbons knotted together in these really cool patterns. Now, since this is meant to be used more decoratively than for actual writing, it can be kind of hard to tell what's actually going on when looking at stuff written in the ceremonial interlace alphabet. Which is completely by design. I mean, this doesn't even look like writing. This design actually says Tajonigon, which means conlanger. Since the ceremonial interlace alphabet is completely decorative and not meant to be used for writing lengthy texts, long vowels are written the same as short vowels. Now, if you look closely at this design, you'll see that most of it is one long continuous band, and the way that band is knotted is what spells out the letters for T-A-X-O-N-I-K-O-N, -O -O and then, just for good measure, it loops back on itself. By the way, when I was making this video's thumbnail, I made the bands thinner to make it easier to appreciate the braided structure. This is supposed to say Kalen. I guess I don't have that much to say about it, but dang, I think this might be my new favorite writing system. It just looks so good. From October 2009 to December 2011, Sylvia Sotomayor did a thing on her blog called Kalen Word of the Day, where every day she highlighted a specific Kalen word. This way of presenting vocabulary one word at a time in a context that's separate from the actual documentation gives a little bit more structure than just reading through the dictionary. Partially sorted by category, and partially walking through translations of different texts. There were a lot of highlights that I took screenshots of as I read through it, and I don't really have that much to say about any of them individually other than, hey, this is neat, so right now I'm just padding out the scripts so that they're not going by too fast for you to see them. As a whole, Kalen vocabulary definitely works to show who the Kalini are and what their culture is like, which is of course by necessity, because there isn't a full work of fiction to go with it. Even though the Kalini aren't human, they aren't really alien. Their culture definitely seems like it would fit in just fine on Earth. The only real indication in the vocabulary that this isn't supposed to be a human language are the words that refer to things that don't exist. But even then, they're usually directly compared to something familiar. Not that I'm complaining, of course. The world building on display in Kalen's vocabulary is very impressive. Anyway, pronouns. The four-way grammatical number distinction made with the pronouns doesn't actually appear anywhere else. Only personal pronouns have separate dual and pockle forms. Also, the reduced forms there are used as nonspecific abbreviations of the other pronouns regardless of number. And they can also be used as relative pronouns. Oh, also, Kalen's numbering system uses octal, base 8. Fun. We now arrive at the main event, the grammar. The whole idea of Kalen is that it doesn't have verbs. How does that even work? Well, one thing at a time. Nouns in Kalen are given prefixes that mark animacy. This is not inherent to a given noun, and in fact, whether something counts as animate or inanimate can vary from speaker to speaker, ranging from only referring to one's own kin as animate to referring to literally everything as animate. The possessed prefixes are used for when something is part of somebody, usually referring to body parts, but it's sometimes used for other things. As I briefly mentioned before, there's also grammatical number. The plural is marked with the e suffix, or yin for animate nouns. Okay, that's enough about that. Now, let's talk about how Kalen works without verbs. So what Kalen has instead of verbs is a set of four words called relationals, which are really just verbs. So exactly as I suspected, Kalen just relabels its verbs as something else. That's not really fair, though. Kalen's relationals work like verbs functionally, but they don't carry any semantic meaning. And, like, the fact that there's only four of them still shouldn't just be written off. There definitely is truth to the claim that Kalen is a verbless language. The first relational is la, the relational of existence. It roughly corresponds to the verb to be. It's used for saying that something exists or that two things are the same. You know, general copula stuff. There's also a past tense te and a negative wa, which count as being the same relational, I guess. The second relational is ni, the relational of change. It's like la, but it's used for change of state instead of static state. Causing something to become something else is a really general concept that encompasses a lot of things that you'd normally use separate verbs for. The way it works actually reminds me a lot of how transitive verbs work in Togipona, my favorite conline. Rather than having a designated verb for something like melt, you instead use an adjective and put some particles around it to talk about a change of state. Instead of saying that heat melts ice, you say that it causes ice to become melted. It's a really useful concept that you can get a lot of mileage out of. The relational ni can also be inflected for agent, replacing a pronoun that normally would be necessary. The third relational is se, the transactional relational. 
It roughly corresponds to the verb to give. It's used for talking about giving and taking things. It's also used for talking about talking in the sense that speaking is giving words. And it's also used for introducing a topic. Just like how ni can be inflected for agent, se can be inflected for source and beneficiary. The resulting table is definitely a lot to take in, but you can still tell that it's not just completely arbitrarily assigning things. A word like sejilte fits in with the other inflections of se with the same source and with the same beneficiary. The final relational is pa, which doesn't have a fun descriptive name. It roughly corresponds to the verb to have. It's actually an extension of something that can be used with la. As you can probably guess, it's used for saying that something has something, both for actual possession and for when something has an abstract property. There's really not that much to this one, but it's still just as versatile as the others. Looking at this system as a whole with these four relationals, I can't help but think that this could have worked with fewer than four. I really don't think they're all strictly necessary. The relational of change could have been merged into the relational of existence with creative use of word order. I mean, earlier I compared the relational of change to how transitive verbs in Tokipona work, and in Tokipona, the stuff handled by Kalen's relationals of existence and change are both covered by the same grammatical particle. I also think the transactional relational and the one without a nickname could be merged into one thing by way of the relational of change. I mean, in a sense, giving someone something is the same as causing them to have it, right? That said, I don't think having the bare minimum number of these relationals was what Sylvia had in mind. I mean, Kalen isn't really an engineered language, is it? It definitely has elements of an engelang, but at heart it's a fictional language and an art language. In a sense, Kalen actually has a lot in common with Dursk. There are both fictional languages that have elements that fit more with the design philosophy of an engineered language. It's just that Kalen does a much, much better job at it. The following text is an excerpt from Aesop's The North Wind and the Sun, translated into Kalen by Sylvia Sotomayor. Se murana mazirien se malo. Yel de teding and thang any. In la mapa and dagen and naneja magang. Ilathni marauna ni gamma chalura chacale prajano. Teding and yeigi in la mapa and dagen and naneja ma. Yamma chalura ru marauna peja keja. Yon yamma anuri na amurana masirin. Yon yamma chalura ra sain angno. Ah, uh, Marauna. All in all, I like Kalen a lot. From the aversions of linguistic universals, to the piecemeal world building, to this divination thing, to my favorite writing system for any conlang, I could feel the passion and dedication that Sylvia Sotomayor put into it. I'm not sure if it's my favorite fictional language, but it's definitely in my top three. Kalen is a wonderful conlang that I'm glad I had the chance to take an in-depth look at. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time, where I'll be reviewing Lingua de Planeta. Black Gill. Black Gill. Hey everyone, in case you didn't notice, I changed the name of this channel to Jan Misely. If you're wondering why, I made a short video announcing the change. Conline Critic isn't going anywhere. That said, I do actually have one big video planned to go between this video and the upcoming Lingua de Planeta episode. I'm unreasonably excited about this one. Oh, I should do a big announcement. Yeah, that'll be cool.